During the 1920s, the decade of prohibition, cocktail appetizers such as shrimp cocktail, fruit cocktail, uh, were extremely popular. Appetizers were served in cocktail glasses, originally meant to hold alcoholic beverages. Cocktail sauce for shrimp was made with ketchup, horseradish, lemon juice, and a little hot sauce. And it became the perfect pairing for shrimp or other fresh seafood. And uh, I love homemade cocktail sauce. Uh, you can open a jar of horseradish and some ketchup and uh, mix your own that way. But if you happen to find, this is a whole root of horseradish, um, try making fresh horseradish cocktail sauce. And this is what you'll grate. You must peel it before you start to grate it. Now, my mom always sent us outdoors with a box grater and a big hunk of horseradish root to cry in the garden as we grated. And cry you do because it is really kind of strong and it is best to grate it outdoors. But on a box grater, it was a lot harder than on one of these fabulous wood rasp type graters. This really works extremely well. And just grate like this. It makes nice, fine uh, pieces of horseradish. See how quickly it does grate? Now put the horseradish right into a bowl and just dampen it with white wine vinegar. I'm gonna need a little bit more horseradish than this. And this takes, as you can see, a little while. There, perfect. So get that into the vinegar. And this you'll just dump right into your ketchup. So three quarters of a cup of ketchup, approximately a half a cup of vinegary horseradish. And does that smell good? Really, really delicious. And you can buy horseradish roots. You don't have to grow them. Lemon juice, just half a lemon is fine. Now you'll need some salt. For those of you who like sugar, you might want to add like a quarter of a teaspoon of sugar. And as much hot sauce as you want. And use your favorite. Mm. Now I think that's cocktail sauce. Mmm, yummy. Now spoon that into your pretty little bowl that's set in ice, crushed ice, in which are perfectly cooked and peeled and deveined shrimp with tails on are standing, fit for any starter for your next party. People will adore it. Tartar sauce, oh, one of my favorite sauces, is a classic accompaniment to fried fish. This is one of the simplest sauces to make. It's a mayonnaise mixture combined with, well, let me show you, capers, cornichon, which are these nice sour French pickles, and shallots, and lemon juice. So let's get started. And now to one third cup of mayonnaise. You can use a good quality store-bought mayonnaise for this, or if you have homemade, all the better. Add one shallot that's been very finely chopped. Three tablespoons of cornichon. These are the little French pickles, vinegary pickles. Uh, and you uh, chop up very finely three of them. two tablespoons of capers. Make sure if they're very, very salty, rinse them. And I'm using the small capers. Some salt and some pepper, freshly ground black pepper. And the juice of half a small lemon. About, basically about a teaspoon, two teaspoons of lemon juice. And this tartar sauce will greatly enhance 
fish and chips, fried clams, fried oysters, or a delicious crab cake. Now you see there's lots of good stuff in the tartar sauce. And I'm going to put a little bit right here on the plate next to my crab cake. This is a lump crab cake made with fresh peaky toe crab from Maine. Mm. What a fantastic thing. Tartar sauce, as I just showed you, is the easiest condiment to make, and uh, you can make it more tart or sweet, depending on your taste. When you bite into an onion ring, texture is just as important as taste. A good onion ring should have a light, crisp exterior with a soft, sweet onion inside. Many people are intimidated to make onion rings, but after today's lesson, you'll see just how easy and delicious they are when made at home. Now I'm using two beautiful yellow onions, onions that look like this, and they've been peeled, and I'm slicing the onions themselves into half-inch slices. These slices will then be broken up into onion rings. Be very careful, use an extremely sharp knife. A sharp knife, because it cuts straight through the fibers of an onion, actually cuts down on the tearing, the emission of gas from the onion. So just let these break into rings. It'll take a little coaxing, but that's an onion ring. All over the world, onions are a very ancient and popular flavoring for food. And they've been cultivated for about 5,000 years. And now we're using safflower oil. You can use canola oil. Best to use a vegetable oil with a high burning point. Okay, well that's enough rings for now. And we will make our batter. One cup of flour, all-purpose flour is good a quarter of a teaspoon of white pepper, a teaspoon of salt, and surprisingly, but important, half a teaspoon of baking powder. Whisk all these together. And now here's the secret ingredient, beer. One cup of a lager beer. The beer contains carbon dioxide, which actually adds to the crispiness of the fried onion. So now this is a little bit lumpy, don't worry about it. You want two tablespoons of iced water. It's a little similar to tempura batter. So here we have it. And alongside some all-purpose flour to first dip the onion ring in, then in the batter. And you just want one layer of onion rings in your batter at one time. I find it best to stir with a fork and drop with a finger. And they cook very quickly. They get golden brown very fast. Don't make a big, big batch of the batter. Just make it multiple times if you're making a lot of onion rings for a party or something. You want the action of the carbon dioxide from the fresh beer to be active. Keep the temperature around 375 degrees and use a deep fry thermometer that clips onto the side of your pot. It's a very useful tool in monitoring oil temperature. Flip this. Look at the great color. Oh my gosh. Now you don't want to overdo right onto a paper towel lined baking sheet. Check your oil temperature constantly. The best way to keep fried food from absorbing too much oil is to keep your oil at the ideal temperature. And for this, it is 375. So as quickly as you can, sprinkle with coarse salt while they're hot and arrange in a serving dish. I like to serve them on parchment like this. They look kind of pretty. Of course, for me, ketchup. Very important condiment for onion rings. A delightful little snack. One that we don't have very often, but when we do, we want them to look 
and taste and be just like these. These beer battered onion rings are great on their own or topped on a burger or steak. Try it, you'll enjoy. Sashimi. Sashimi. Or crudo. Yes, you call it crudo because you are Italian. So we're gonna start with the, uh, the fluke. And we're gonna just cut little quarter inch pieces at a little bit of an angle. Hmm. I'm gonna put it on right on the plate. Nice. Choose a nice clean plate. And you could do the it fish, either. The fish should be really icy cold, right? Icy cold. And as fresh as can possibly be. And then we're gonna, you're gonna finish that up. I'm gonna start making a plate with the uh, porgy. On the porgy, what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove the little blood line here. So we're gonna cut out the little center. We're gonna make sure that there's no skin. We don't wanna eat that skin. The skin can make it a little bit tough. So cut along the red yeah. line, right? Cut, uh, cut that red line out, yes. Good to use a good knife. You want a good sharp knife. Now, there are restaurants in the world now that are called crudo restaurants. There are places in oh, the world. Oh gosh, yes, and they're just taking the fresh fish and cutting it up and making it into, now how did you cut that, Again, okay, just into chunks? Yep, same thing, cut it a little bit of an angle, we're gonna put all that on one plate. And we're gonna, then what we're gonna do is we have some toasted pine nuts here. We're gonna put a little bit of pine nuts with the uh, porgy. I like to actually put it right on top of the fish. All right, you made some beautiful radishes. You could either use them as slices or you could make matchsticks out of them. All right, and we're gonna put that with the, with the flu. Mm, so beautiful. We're just gonna s sprinkle them around, all right? <clears throat> oh, I see. Oh, can I do it this way? You could do it however you like. Okay. That's one of the great things about cooking, is that you can be creative. With the, with the radish, I like the lime. You want to make sure that when you squeeze the lime, you're going to get it actually on the fish. Oh, and eat this with chopsticks? You could eat it with chopsticks, you can eat it with a fork, you can eat it with your fingers. How okay? pretty. And then with the porgy, we're going to do lemon. Don't put too much, though. You want to be careful. You just want a little bit, because otherwise you're going to dilute the fish. You're not making ceviche. Exactly. We're going to go salt. Thank you. So I'm using fleur de sel, as yep. you are. We're going to do pepper. And then the most important ingredient, other than the fish, is good quality extra virgin. Make sure you get the oil on the fish, just like we said with the citrus. Pignoli nuts. And now, are these pignoli nuts toasted? They are toasted. Mm. Now, you could also cook up a little bit of the fish skin, couldn't you, and crispy it? You could, you could have taken the fluke skin and baked it, or you could have fried it, and it would come out nice and crispy. That would be so good. And It'd I, be and, delicious. Yeah, and, they, and you can just crink, crumple that all over. Oops. Get your and salt. Salt. Your pepper. So you oh like boy. me, I like pepper over there. You, you like it like me, I like a lot of salt. Oh, so do I. These are beautiful platters. There, what do you think? Outstanding. Oh my gosh. Now, forks are not the right implement. We must find some chopsticks. Oh, I don't know about that. You can use your fingers if you don't want to use a <laughs> fork. But this is raw fish at its very best. Dave Pasternak style. Oh, Dave, this is so utterly beautiful. And it's just the way I love to eat fresh caught fish. Now, here is one of my favorite bean recipes, the old fashioned Boston baked beans. And the Massachusetts tradition of eating baked beans for dinner on Saturday night uh, seems to have originated in Puritan Boston. The Sabbath started at sundown on Saturday. And according to Puritan belief, no work was to be done until sundown on Sunday. So on Saturday morning, the bean pot was put in the low heat of the fireplace oven, probably one of those old fashioned beehive ovens, either next to the fireplace or in the back of the fireplace. And, uh, and in the hopes that the beans would be ready by supper time. And the leftovers were kept warm in the fireplace and served for breakfast on Sunday. So uh, this is my recipe for Boston baked beans. We have soaked some very nice pinto beans. They've been washed, scrubbed, as Cesare showed us, and uh, soaked for 24 hours, two pounds of beans. And I am now 
going to drain those beans. We're not going to reserve the soaking liquid. We're just going to use the soaked beans. And you can use navy beans, pinto beans, cranberry beans. Uh, you can choose, but pinto beans work very, very nicely. I've used them several times. And, um, and navy beans are um, a little bit smaller bean, and I've used those quite a few times. So now this is a very simple recipe, although it takes uh, several hours to cook. Now it's best, I think, to use a bean pot. This is a newfangled bean pot. Old bean pots were the typical crock looking beige with a brown stripe and a little cover on the top. But this works very, very nicely. Put uh, in the bottom of the pot one large onion, halved and sliced into, oh, it's about quarter inch slices. And these go, just strew these right in the bottom of the pot. Smells good. Four canned plum tomatoes. And if you don't have plum tomatoes, you can use, heaven forbid, about a half a cup of ketchup. Uh, you also use some dry mustard, one tablespoon plus a teaspoon, a couple bay leaves, broken, put that in, and 12 whole cloves, throw those in, and half a cup of packed brown sugar. This can also go right into the bottom. I like dark brown sugar. And salt, a tablespoon of salt. Tablespoon plus a teaspoon. And about a half a teaspoon of black pepper. So that's pretty much it, except for molasses, which I like to put over the top, salt pork, and fresh water. And your soaked beans go right into the bean pot. You can sprinkle a little bit more salt over the top. And unsulfured molasses, a half a cup. And I like to go over the entire top. Get every last bit. You might even want to use a little bit more molasses. Some people like really dark, dark baked beans. I do. And now the last thing to do is put your salt pork over the top. Big, chunky pieces. Like that. And add five cups of water. I don't stir, I don't do anything. I just leave it just like this. Now, cover and transfer to a 300 degree preheated oven. And you're gonna bake these covered without stirring until the beans are tender and the liquid has thickened about six hours. Now you can check the beans every 45 minutes or so, adding more boiling water if necessary to keep the beans slightly soupy at all times, but not soaky, soaky wet. Well, hopefully the beans are done. And, uh, oh, they look so good. Look what's happened to those beautiful, beautiful pinto beans. They certainly have changed color. And uh, you can taste them. Just see if they need any salt or pepper. Mm. They taste just right. Mm, the salt pork has fallen apart just like it should. And if you have some bread, Boston brown bread, some hot dogs, potato salad, you can enjoy a hearty bowl of Boston baked beans. Delicious. Not only can you confit duck, you can also confit many other things, including tomatoes. And slow roasting tomatoes in olive oil concentrates and sweetens their flavors, making even ordinary tomatoes rich and delicious. Uh, and so let's get started. Make a little X in the bottom of a nice ripe tomato. This is best done in tomato season, but out of season you can find uh, some nice hydroponic tomatoes or greenhouse tomatoes that look like this. Um, put in boiling water for 10 seconds and then immediately immerse the tomatoes in iced water. This will stop the cooking, keep the tomatoes um, nice and hard, uh, but allow you to peel off the skin. 
And so just now peel the tomatoes and core them. See how easily the skins come off? Just simple, simple technique. This is the same technique you'd use if you were canning tomatoes. Um, and now to core, just take this, the point of your knife and just go around like this and pop that out. So now we have our baking dish, uh, a dish just large enough to hold the tomatoes and sprinkle the garlic, sliced garlic cloves, about four in the bottom of a dish and some basil. Place the tomatoes cut side down in the dish and add about a half a cup of olive oil. Season with some salt and just use a, a good coarse salt. And this is a really, really fine way to intensify the um, flavor of these tomatoes. So half a cup. And now these will kind of collapse after 50 minutes and they will be lightly browned and very tender. I'll show you what they look like. So now let the tomatoes cool to room temperature before packing in a nice glass jar. And oh, does this smell good? It looks good. And the tomatoes will only get better as they sit in the flavored olive oil. Ball jars like this are very useful. These are the old fashioned canning jars uh, in which you pack vegetables, fruits, relishes, pickles, confits. And make sure you use all of this olive oil. There's lots and lots of air pockets. So the best thing to do with that is take a tiny little rubber scraper like this and run it down the side of the jar making room for all the liquid to fill all those air spaces, those air pockets. Always when you're covering a jar, wipe the rim of the jar with a warm cloth, cleaning it well. You can wipe the jar later on and put the seal cap on Hold it with your finger in the middle like this, and then tighten the ring. And then wipe your jar. Now, tomato confit actually improves as it sits. Um, and after you're finished with the tomatoes, you can also use the flavorful oil in vinaigrettes or in sauces. When you're grilling, just spoon a little bit of that garlicky, basil-y, tomato-y oil uh, on your chicken or on your fish, and it too will um, greatly improve those flavors. So you can confit little cherry tomatoes. These are many different colors, as well as the large tomatoes. A very good way to use up some of those excess tomatoes from your garden or from the farmer's market. Now, remember, once confit like this and put in olive oil, you must refrigerate these and they'll stay in your refrigerator for um, several weeks. But don't forget to use them, they're delicious. And now you've all heard of seven bean salad. Well, here is the ultimate version of the seven bean salad. Uh, so, the, oh, Cesare, this is the oven roasted beans. Yes. Okay. They are more dark than you They see, are, yeah. How long have these cooked? This is one hour and a half. Really, that's all, and it's really much darker. Oh, and these are the black and white beans, calypso beans. You want to taste Yeah, oh, of course. Mmm, extremely tasty. So we take the three quarter of cup. You can taste the garlic much more in the oven roasted, can't you? Yes, it's a more strong, and in the end it was the same mm. quantity. So now we have seven beans all together ready for the seven bean salad. So we have chickpeas. Chickpeas. We have dried snow cap beans. Yes. That have been cooked. Those are pretty. Scarlet runner beans. Now look at the size of these. These are really amazing. I love scarlet runner beans. And the dried kidney beans, which are reddish. 
The cranberry. Oh, the cranberry beans. The Appaloosa beans. And the very beautiful that we just took out of the oven, the Calypso beans. So each one, they bring different flavor, different consistency that we blend all together. Then we're going to add the onions, and the onions, I normally marry in the red wine vinegar because I like the onions, but I don't like the smell the onions. So in that way, you're going to keep the flavor, mm. the onions, without mm. the two. Is that a red onion? Red onions. How beautiful. You can use the white onions too, but I grew up with red onions, so that is a nice color In Luca, too. the red onions? Yes, oh. we don't have white onions. Oh. The only white onions is uh, in the beginning, the, the season, the onions, when they are white. Quarter of a cup of celery. The celery is a crispy, is a crunchy. And a fourth of a cup of Italian flat leaf parsley, of course. And then now we need to put the olive oil, and they're going to put the pepper, the beans, they want a lot of olive oil. Yeah, they love olive oil, don't they? So you're going to stir. So pretty. So this is best right now, or will it be good tomorrow? You can, is that good now, but tomorrow they taste much better. Oh, okay. So when you want to serve it, or you can serve in a plate with some chevy parmigiano in top. Mm, so pretty. And this is a good with the bottarga, oh. or if you like it, to put the anchovy, oh. or caviar. Oh, that is so very beautiful. Have seven beans, have 10 different beans. All the different dried beans, try what you haven't before. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Every region in America has its own version of barbecue sauce. Some are sweet, some are spicy, some are vinegary, some are thick, some are thin. But all are served with grilled meats, poultry, or fish. And today I'm making a classic Kansas City sweet sauce. That's tomato-based, uh, balanced with a little brown sugar and cider vinegar. And of course, just a hint of lemon. Barbecue sauce is a thick, piquant, or sweet mixture that contains ingredients like vinegar and tomato, which help cut the fattiness in meats. And the Kansas City version that I'm making is one uh, half of a small onion grated, uh, cooked in a tablespoon of butter, add two cloves of chopped garlic, add some salt, some pepper, I'm gonna turn up the heat just a little bit and add the rest of the ingredients. I love making barbecue sauce. One and a half cups of ketchup. This is a sauce that my brother George made all the time. And uh, he loves to cook outside, but he loves making his own barbecue sauce. And it's an adaptation of that sauce uh, that I'm making today. Um, two tablespoons of unsulfured molasses. Very tasty and dense. I love the taste of molasses. And two tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce. Keep stirring, you don't want anything to burn or brown. You just want it to cook. I once was a judge in Memphis at the great big Memphis barbecue. And I remember I was the whole hog judge. And uh, I always kept coming back to pretty much the same vinegary, uh, sweet sauce. It's very much like this one too. Half a cup of packed light brown sugar, a tablespoon of Dijon mustard, a nice big tablespoon. And oh, here it is a third of a cup of cider vinegar. And for just a little bit of a kick, a half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. And this can just sit here on the stove top. Oh, I almost forgot my favorite ingredient. And one thing I did learn down in Memphis was that lemon was essential in pretty much every one of my favorite sauces. And uh, you could detect it, and you could miss it if it wasn't there. Now this sauce has a little bit of texture to it. 
which is the onion and the garlic. But we're going to put this in a blender because we really don't want any texture. We want a nice, smooth sauce. The sauce is cooked. It tastes so good. I just, just had a little spoonful. Now it's time to smooth out the sauce and just add all the sauce to the jar of your blender. And be very, very careful when blending hot liquids. We don't have that much in the blender jar, so it's not going to splatter, but be very careful not to fill the blender jar too full when you're blending hot liquids. Uh, make sure that uh, put a towel over it so in case it does blow off the top for some reason. And always start on low. I always like to start on low. See how it popped up? If that were full up to here, it would have popped the top off. And then you can go a little higher and a little higher. And then to puree. That should be it. Mmm, looks really, really good. Now transfer your sauce to a bowl or a jar or whatever you're going to keep it in. And while you're grilling your ribs, your chicken, your pork, uh, just in the last five minutes or so, brush on the sauce. These have been perfectly grilled baby back ribs. Oh, they look so good. I'll let you taste them so that you can decide if you're going to make this sweet Kansas barbecue sauce. So it seems that preserved lemons are popping up on restaurant menus everywhere. Uh, in fact, even one of my recipes in this uh, cooking series uses preserved lemons in a pasta dish. Preserved lemons can be used as a seasoning to give dishes a boost of flavor, and I love to use them. Uh, I use them when I make couscous, when I make tagines, when I serve pasta with botarga, and they are very easy to make, and actually the ones that you make at home taste a lot better than the ones that you buy. And what you need, salt, coarse salt, kosher salt, lemons, nice bright-skinned lemons, and a sterilized preserving jar. Uh, and this is a canning jar. It's a quart with a wide mouth. I think the wide mouth really helps. And just process this in boiling water for approximately 10 minutes. So let that drain well and start preparing the lemons. Cut off the stem end like this. And then cut from the very bottom of the lemon down about three quarters of the way with a sharp knife and cut the lemon into quarters like that. Just like that. So it's four pieces, but they're still held together. This is the traditional Moroccan way of uh, preserving lemons. Um, and then put the lemons into the salt and really pack the lemon with as much salt as you can possibly force down in those cuts. Put a little bit of salt in the bottom of the jar and start putting these packed lemons. You see there's salt down in each of the cuts. Put the lemon right into the jar. And you may get um, four or five lemons in a jar. And you see the lemons are getting softer immediately. The salt reacts with the lemon flesh and the juice. It softens them, but it actually still keeps them um, a nice texture. So I'm just putting as much salt in this jar as I possibly can. And squashing those lemons down. And this will go right into the refrigerator. Again, remember to wipe the seal. The juices will exude from the lemons and you'll have a lot of juice as well as um, salty juice as the lemon sits in the jar. So there, that goes right into the refrigerator. Now, if you're going to be using these lemons for cooking, once uh, they've stayed in the salt for up to a month, you take the lemon out, see a totally different texture. 
scrape out the flesh. It's the peel that you're looking for. And you can blanch the peel in a little bit of hot water. Or if you're using it in a bastilla, you can just use it like this. But it's a kind of almost translucent lemon peel. And whatever size you want to cut it into. Generally, it's a small cube like this. Very pungent, very tasty preserved lemons. Preserved lemons will keep for a year or more in a dark cupboard. Uh, the ideal curing time is probably three months. However, in as little as one month, the salt will have pulled all the water out of the rind, transforming it into a flavorful ingredient, an ingredient as flavorful and as versatile as vinegar, salt, or spice. Today's lesson is all about emulsions. Uh, which is a mixture in which acid, like lemon juice or uh, vinegar, is suspended in some sort of oil. Nothing is better than a good homemade vinaigrette. Now, vinaigrettes are infinitely variable. You can experiment with different oils, such as grapeseed oil, olive oil, canola oil, hazelnut oil, walnut oil. Uh, you can also uh, experiment with different kinds of acids, champagne vinegar, sherry vinegar, rice wine vinegar, one of my favorites, red wine vinegar, and even white or red balsamic vinegar. You can also add cheeses and spices and herbs, anchovies, uh, but for such a simple preparation, it's vital to use the very, very best ingredients because there are only five or six ingredients, including salt and pepper, in a vinaigrette. You start first with uh, the acid. And I like to put the acid right in either a salad bowl like this, if I'm going to be tossing a salad, or in a jar like this with a tight-fitting uh, cap so you can shake it. Uh, this is the way I generally make a vinaigrette at home. I think I'll make a champagne vinegar vinaigrette today. And in your pantry, you should have a variety of good oils and a variety of good vinegars. So basically start with a tablespoon or two of the acid, and I'm going to start with two tablespoons of white champagne vinegar. And into the vinegar, I put a half a teaspoon of salt. And I like to mix that together. I like the salt to be dissolved. I remember when I was in France, the first time I ever went to France, and the waiter mixed the vinaigrette right at the table using two spoons like this and mixing the salt in the spoon and then putting it in the bowl. Uh, I've never forgotten that, so I always try to mix the salt into the acid. And now, uh, this is going to be a vinaigrette to dress a lettuce salad, uh, so I like to add a little bit of Dijon mustard. Dijon adds a very nice flavor and about a half a tablespoon of Dijon mustard. Keep both grainy and smooth Dijon mustard on hand in the refrigerator, a very versatile addition to a lot of different dishes that you make in your kitchen. And some black pepper, I'd say, oh, about a quarter of a teaspoon, freshly ground black pepper. And because this is going to address greens that just were picked out of my garden, add one shallot that's been very finely minced. Shallot is a member of the onion family. It has a very nice mild taste. It'll add crunch and additional flavor to the vinaigrette. So basically, that's the acid into which uh, we will add oil. This one is just going to be a plain olive oil vinaigrette. Now this is where the emulsification takes place. And the general proportions, three parts oil, one part acid. So just start drizzling and you're going to see this vinegar in the bowl become emulsified in the oil. Now you have to do this in a steady stream, just droplet by droplet, and whisk vigorously until you see a visible thickening take place. And if you measured this, you would see that we used two tablespoons of vinegar, and we're gonna use approximately six tablespoons of oil, three to one. Oh, see, it's already becoming thick and creamy, and it smells really good. It's important to add this in steady, slow stream. If you dumped it all in at once, it would take a lot longer to emulsify. 
but you see you don't see any separation occurring here. It is really creamy and beautiful. Little tiny bit more. And really and truly, this is a very smart way to do it because if you do it in the salad bowl in which you're going to make your salad, you haven't made too much dressing, you don't have leftover, and you can toss your salad right here and you use up every single bit of the expensive oil and the expensive vinegar that you have invested in to make a great vinaigrette. So there it is, vinaigrette, simple vinaigrette. Now the jar method, very similar in uh, terms of, of um, ingredients, but I'll just vary it a little bit. I think I'll do a rice wine vinaigrette. Again, measure your ingredients. I'll do three tablespoons of rice wine vinegar. That means how many tablespoons of oil? Nine. Salt, a little bit more salt this time. And rice wine vinegar has a kind of a little bit of a sweetness to it, and I enhance the sweetness with just a pinch of sugar. I think it tastes really good. Black pepper and we'll do a grapeseed oil. Very nice, almost flavorless oil, but it, it really mixes nicely with the rice wine vinaigrette. We're gonna measure nine tablespoons. Nine tablespoons of grapeseed oil. And I'm gonna put a little bit of mustard. and shake. So this looks very nice. Of course, taste, tastes very good. Very nice, light vinaigrette. Uh, you can add fresh coriander to this chopped. You could do chives. You could add shallots to this one if you like. But uh, this will be very nice over butter lettuce or any very delicate greens like mesclun salad. Um, now, both of these could be done in a blender, which would last longer than those made with a whisk or a jar. And if you look at this, you don't see any separation at all. It's still very nicely emulsified. So there it is, lesson number one, vinaigrette. Uh, very easy to make, no need to go out and buy jarred salad dressings when you can make vinaigrettes so very easily in your own kitchen. A lesson in vegetable preparation wouldn't be complete without a recipe for a tian. A tian is a traditional dish from Provence. It's named for the earthenware baking dish in which the vegetables are cooked. Now for this tian, I've looked for firm, small to medium vegetables. Skin on squash should be unblemished, nice and firm, no soft spots. And uh, cut off the stem end as well as the end of the vegetable and uh, cut in uniform slices. I'm using a chef's knife for this. Make sure you get the same thickness of slices for all the vegetables. So here we have these lovely yellow squash. Now, if you're going to use eggplant, and I think eggplant is very delicious in a tian, uh, don't choose this uh, kind of Italian eggplant. Look for the Japanese if you can. This doesn't really need to be salted. The salt brings out the excess bitterness from the flesh. So try to find the Japanese eggplant. And this too, cut off that little end. So this is a very pretty eggplant. It's a nice color skin and a very white, mild flesh. If you're growing eggplants, try to grow some of these Japanese uh, purple eggplants as well as white eggplants. And they also come in a kind of a lime green skin now. Farmers are growing extraordinary produce. Here's our zucchini. Now you can, if you want to make a very delicate tian, slice the vegetables half this thickness, like an eighth of an inch. Uh, and those look very pretty. You can cook individual tians in small ramekins to serve with a rack of lamb. Very pretty too. And tomatoes, um, vine ripened of course. I'm using plum tomatoes because I find them less juicy, but still very flavorful, and they have a lot of meat. Uh, this is a country tian that I'm making. That's my excuse for uh, making it as simple as possible, country. I'm gonna use the rectangular 
earthenware dish. It looks nice with what I'm serving. Just some grilled fish tonight. Oh, and here's a red onion. Oh, this is a perfect onion. Lovely. A sharp knife is essential when cutting vegetables like this. A garlic clove cut in half. Just the flavor of garlic rubbed in the bottom of a dish imparts a terrific flavor in the tian. And now a tiny bit of olive oil. So now it's time to assemble. I'm gonna start with the onion and tomato. I'm gonna to put them in the middle of the dish. And salt and pepper as you go along so that the vegetables do get flavor. And now on the sides, I'll do yellow squash, eggplant, green squash. So here we have our layering going on. And now just sprinkle over the leaves of some fresh thyme. You can put a few branches of thyme on the top and a few torn leaves of marjoram. So now a little bit more olive oil. But that is a vegetable tian. Now before I put this into a 400 degree preheated oven, I'm just gonna put a few garlic cloves on top. These will roast in the skins, and then you'll have them to squeeze out on the bread that you're gonna serve with dinner. So there, 400 degrees for 25 minutes. You can base with the pan juices and a brush, and then bake for another 25 minutes. And then you have a real tian. And I have so many vegetables left over, I'm going to make another in this oval dish. I think that'll be pretty too. I think our tian are done. Oh yes, they smell extra good. Oh boy, look at how beautiful these are. Hmm. Not only are they good hot out of the oven, but they're also good later on today and even tomorrow. Tian, a very versatile way to use a lot of those vegetables. Once you learn how to make it, you can vary the ingredients. Whatever you choose, it's always good. Artichokes are high in magnesium and vitamin A, vitamin C, and very, very rich in fiber. Once you know how to prepare them, you're gonna discover how delicious they really are. So I'm taking off just about a half an inch of the top of the artichoke. And then for steaming and eating, take off the stem right below the lower level of, uh, of leaves. Snap off any smallish leaves. And hear that snap? Fresh. That's a sign of freshness. So these can all, you can save the, the stems and steam them too, they're very good. But uh, these are so big that I don't think we're gonna really need any extra artichoke. Now, with your kitchen shears, just take off that tip of the leaf. Each leaf has a thorn. Uh, artichokes are a thistle. And if allowed to go to seed, uh, they become great, big, beautiful, thistly like flowers on the stem. And uh, so there you have it. I like to loosen the leaves. Down inside is the core, which you will remove when it's cooked, and also the heart. The stem is the beginning of the heart that's inside, very meaty part of the artichoke. So now, if you're doing lots of these, immediately immerse the trimmed artichoke in a bowl of acidulated water, which is just cold water with lots of lemon in it. So these were prepared a little while ago and they have not browned at all. So this is good. We have a steamer basket inserted into this pan and these are gonna cook for approximately 40 minutes. So make sure you have enough water in your pan and the water is salted. So um, just put this cut side down on the steamer basket. We'll do three of these artichokes at a time because actually that's all I have room for in this pot. So if you're gonna do six, do two pots and you'll save time. Cover, 40 minutes. Artichokes are best used the day that you purchase them, but they can be stored, they, uh, unwashed, in a bowl in the refrigerator for up to four days. I like to cover it with a, a little bit of plastic wrap or even a, a dish towel. The peak season for eating artichokes grown in America is from March through May. 
And if you'd like to add a little bit more flavor to your artichoke, just throw in a little bunch of herbs. This is tarragon. And I just want to infuse a little bit more flavor in there. So that's the beginning of the cooking process. In 40 minutes, they'll be ready. Now these look done, but you must test. So poke the stem end with a knife. Oh, see how easily that inserts right into the stem end? And then I suggest pulling off a leaf and testing it for doneness with your teeth. Mm, the flesh comes right off, very tasty. Okay, they're ready to come out. And I suggest taking them out with a pair of tongs and putting them right side up. Cooking them upside down actually is a good way to do it because they don't get water soaked. Um, they don't have a chance to get all soggy. Mm, these taste so good. Let them cool a little tiny bit while you prepare your melted butter. So we're gonna make some tarragon butter right now. And uh, per artichoke, sounds like a lot, but half stick of butter per person. They're not gonna eat it all, so don't worry. Just melt this with a little bit of tarragon. Just the, the leaves cut into little pieces. You don't have to finely chop it or anything. Now, another thing that you could do is um, a little bit of lemon juice into the butter. Half a lemon's fine. And these squeezers are great because they don't let any pits get in there. Very excellent. And I want to serve the artichokes on these beautiful oval dishes. We have some creamy, thick vinaigrette for those of you who don't like melted butter, and this little dish is for the melted butter. So now, ready to prepare the artichokes. This is spreading nicely. You know that it's very well cooked. Take the center out, and these come out nicely just by pinching them. See that? Now, I don't throw that away. I eat the little ends, but... And then with a spoon, just gently scrape down to the heart. That's what you're taking out. The, that's the thistly, uh, sharp part of the artichoke. You just throw that into the waste bowl. It's not edible. Now, you can serve it like, like this. You can put a pretty thin slice of lemon down on the inside, like that. And here's our butter already melted. Divide that evenly amongst all the cups. And that's your artichoke presentation. There are many, many ways to enjoy artichokes, but this is probably the simplest and the one I like the best. Enjoy. This quick pickling method is great because it preserves the pink color of the red onions and it doesn't require the many steps of canning. Um, so in a pan, just heat a tablespoon of mustard seeds and a tablespoon of coriander seeds. Just warm them just to get the flavors going. Three cups of white balsamic vinegar. This is a little bit difficult to find, but a good grocer will probably have white balsamic vinegar. Three quarters of a cup of water. Six tablespoons of sugar. And six tablespoons of salt. This is your pickling brine. Just heat that up a little bit just to dissolve the sugar and the salt. And now the onions are just cut in half and then slice like this, similar to the method I used for the onion soup. A nice way to cut onions. It's a little bit different and tests your knife skills. Use a very, very sharp knife essential for cutting onions. Now all of these onions, two red onions and two white onions, will be packed in a canning jar. Red onions are milder than yellow onions, as are uh, white onions, much, much milder. These are Vidalia onions. And Vidalia onions were discovered by some farmers in Georgia. They discovered an onion with a really sweet and delicious flavor, and now it is a giant crop in Georgia. So pack the onions in a pickling jar, mixing white with red, 
I like these jars with the clamp tops and the rubber rings. They are very, very effective and pretty. You could use all one kind of onion for this. It seems like everybody's into pickling these days. Pickled food is very good for you. And the fermentation that goes on in pickling adds some very good features to vegetables. It's very good for your digestive system. And when you're pickling, it's very important that you use kosher salt or pickling salt. It has no iodine, no added minerals, or anti-caking agents that many other salts have. So be careful about your choice of salt when pickling. So look how pretty this is. This is great. Add bay leaves to your jar. You can just stick them down the sides. And three sprigs of thyme. These two can be pushed down into the onions. They're going to decrease in volume as they pickle. So don't worry about having too many onions in the jar. You can press them down even further with a rubber spatula. I learned the art of pickling at my mother's side. She did so many different kinds of pickles and I still like to make pickles. We have our warmed spices, coriander and mustard, and our brine is almost ready. So just check to see that all the sugar and salt is dissolved. I think we can now pour the pickling liquid into a heat-proof measuring cup. This will make it easier to pour into the jar. I don't trust pouring from a pot into that mouth of the jar. And I must tell you, it smells very good. That balsamic vinegar has a unique aroma. So now this gets poured right into your onions. Cover all the solids by about a half an inch. And then this can be covered and kept in the refrigerator for up to a week or 10 days. This is what happens after a week. Do you see the difference between this and this? All of the onions have taken on the pinkness of the red onion. They are crispy, tasty, mellow, and a wonderful, wonderful accompaniment to grilled fish, chicken, they're wonderful on hamburgers. Oh my gosh, so good. And they don't leave your breath smelling oniony. So try pickling some onions. It's a great way to complement the sweet flavors of onions. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you on the next episode of Cooking School. Now this might seem very, very basic to many of you, but indeed, if you follow these steps, you will have perfectly beautiful, crispy vegetables for your crudite and for the rest of your meal. And now we're gonna start with the mildest of the vegetables in front of me, snow peas. Snow peas should be flat and green with just a little hint of the actual peas inside. And for preparation, basically that's the stem end, just pull and get that little tiny string off the pea. This can be done the morning of a meal or a party. Uh, it can even be done the day before, but not too much more in advance. Now, on a stove, bring a big pot of water to a raging boil. Add, oh, about a teaspoon of salt. The salt really does help flavor the vegetables. Same thing goes for the sugar snaps. If they have a stem end on, just break that off. We have purple beans, which are very pretty, but when you cook them, they get a little paler. Now, yellow beans, I love these. They're also known as wax beans. See how beautiful they are, a uniform color, plump, crispy. They should snap when you snap them, just like that. Um, they should not look like this. This is a bean that should be thrown away. That's not what you wanna buy. You wanna buy firm, crispy beans. Uh, these are haricot verts very fine string beans. That too, just pull off 
the stem end. Uh, and some people don't even like this little point and cut that off too. I actually like the little points, so I leave them on, especially for crudite. So let's put the snow peas into the boiling water. Now these will stay in from 30 seconds to 60 seconds. This is blanching. Now look what's happened already. Look at the color. These are so beautiful. Okay, now here I have a large bowl filled with iced water and a strainer right inside. Okay, these are already blanched and now we're going to shock them or another thing to call this is refresh them in the iced water. So you can do a whole lot of vegetables quickly this way. Just keep a little assembly line going. So while those shock, put in your snap peas. Now while those are in for 45 uh, seconds to a minute, shake the excess water off your snow peas and put them on a baking sheet that has a towel on it. So these are ready. Mm. Really crispy, but tasty. The flavor has really come out. You can do all of this in the morning before your party, and they'll look very, very nice at six o'clock for cocktails. Now look at the color. <gasps> so amazing. There's a big transformation. Right into the ice bath. Now, don't start with the purple. The purple are gonna lose their color. Start with the lightest color of the string beans. That would be the wax bean. Now I have a rack here because I don't want any moisture on the vegetables. Notice I put a piece of plastic wrap over the cookie sheet, a cake rack, and then another towel. And you can just take your peas and lay them out in a very thin pile. And they're not quite dry. A little moisture is okay, but they don't want to be sitting in water. And I would just put that up like that. Now beans are gonna take a little bit longer than peas. The way I test is when I put them in, it was kind of, they were kind of stiff. It's sort of like asparagus. If they flop a little bit, I feel that they're done enough. These are flopping. So now that can go right into the ice water. Refresh the ice water, add more ice cubes if the ice cubes start to melt. Now the haricot vert. Now haricot vert, despite their thinness, are a little tough. So they might take a little bit longer than a wax bean to cook. Now I love what happened to the wax beans. You see the color is really, really pretty. Another thing that I do with string beans or any of these, these can then, like the, like the sugar snaps, if you wanna serve them with your dinner, keep them cool like this, then put them in a tiny bit of very hot water in a skillet with a tablespoon of butter, salt, pepper, heat them up that way, and you have perfectly cooked vegetables. Okay, so here we go with the wax beans. The haricot vert. As I said, these take a little bit longer. The purple string beans. Oh, now look at the color. Now, if that could only say, but the purple vegetables that are becoming very popular now, purple cauliflower, purple broccoli, they all kind of fade in the water. See, they don't maintain that gorgeous color, but they're still tasty. Someone, a hybridizer, if they work on this and get the string bean to stay purple, wow, would that be great. Okay, so now make sure the moisture is gone and then you can start arranging these. So make little piles in your hand and, and choose pretty glasses. This is just one way to serve these blanched vegetables. Have patience, don't rush, enjoy what you're doing and we're serving our crudite with a delicious cucumber ranch dip. So if you're blanching vegetables like broccoli, make sure you cut that uh, vegetable all to uniform size if you're gonna be doing blanching like this. Oh, well, this is starting to look just amazing, I think. Need a few more sugar snaps here in this glass and you have a very healthy and delicious crudite. Enjoy.